All right, so get ready because uh, we're going deep today, folks, into a topic that's really, I think, captured a lot of people's imaginations. That's quantum mechanics and consciousness. You know, you sent over some really fascinating material and it uh, looks like we're going to be doing some separating. Of the real science from the quantum hype, I'm really curious about, you know, <laughs> whether those strange quantum phenomena that we always hear about, things like entanglement and superposition, could actually be happening in our brains and contributing to consciousness. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's definitely a question that's leading to some interesting research. And it's definitely important to distinguish that from the pseudoscience that's out there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've all seen those claims about, you know, quantum healing and whatnot. Um, where do people even get that stuff? Well, they often latch on to a few key terms like entanglement. Yeah. Without really understanding the science behind them. For example, some might twist the concept of non-locality in entanglement where two particles are linked regardless of distance, to suggest that our souls exist outside our bodies. But entanglement is a specific type of correlation between particles. Yeah. And it doesn't really lend itself to those kinds of interpretations. Right, so let's get back to the real science then. The article that you sent over tackles how quantum mechanics might play a role in consciousness. What are some of the key things that researchers are looking at? Well, one of the most intriguing areas of research focuses on microtubules these tiny structures inside neurons, um, they're essential for cell function. But some scientists believe they could be creating environments where quantum effects last longer than usual. You know, that's fascinating. You know what? One of the big challenges is that those quantum effects are usually so fleeting, especially in a warm, wet environment like the brain. Yeah, that's right. Quantum effects tend to be most prominent at the subatomic level. So if microtubules are creating these protected pockets where quantum mechanics can operate, does that mean they could be impacting consciousness? That's the hypothesis that uh, some researchers are exploring. And it gets even more interesting when you consider a controversial theory known as orchestrated objective reduction, or orcsor. Ah, yes. The Orkelier hypothesis. From what I understand, it suggests that consciousness actually arises from quantum processes happening inside these microtubules, not just from the usual firing of neurons. That's a pretty radical idea, isn't it? It is, and it's been met with a fair amount of skepticism. The idea that these tiny structures could be the seat of consciousness is certainly a departure from conventional neuroscience. The Orkerfeer hypothesis specifically proposes that quantum computations, specifically a process called objective reduction, occur within microtubules and somehow give rise to consciousness. So I'm curious, what kind of evidence are they using to support this theory? Well, one line of research that's relevant to both microtubules and consciousness looks at how anesthetics work. It turns out that anesthetics can disrupt the normal function of microtubules. And that's got researchers wondering if this disruption of microtubule activity and potentially any quantum processes happening within them could be how anesthetics cause us to lose consciousness. Hold on, that's really interesting. We know that anesthetics knock us out, <laughs> but we don't fully understand how they do it at a fundamental level. So are they saying that anesthetics are somehow interfering with quantum processes in microtubules? And that's what shuts down consciousness. It's one of the intriguing possibilities being investigated. It's certainly not conclusive, but it's a clue that researchers are taking seriously. I can see why that's so exciting. If it turns out to be true, it would mean that we're not just talking about quantum mechanics happening in some abstract realm, but that it could be directly involved in something as fundamental as our own awareness. So we're exploring this idea that anesthetics, something we use all the time in medicine, could be giving us clues about the quantum nature of consciousness. Pretty mind-blowing. Yeah, it really is. It uh, yeah. really highlights how much we still don't know. Yeah about both anesthetics and consciousness itself. The fact that these chemicals can temporarily switch off our awareness suggests there might be some very specific processes at play. And the article you mentioned suggested that those processes might be happening in microtubules, those tiny structures we talked about earlier. And it mentioned that anesthetics can actually disrupt the way microtubules function. Exactly, and remember, microtubules are thought to potentially create an environment where those fragile quantum effects can hang around a bit longer. So the hypothesis is that anesthetics might be disrupting those quantum processes within microtubules, ultimately leading to a loss of consciousness. Okay, so that's starting to make sense. But what does that disruption actually look like? What's going on at the molecular level? That's where things get really complex. There are different types of anesthetics, and they likely interact with microtubules in different ways. Some studies have shown that certain anesthetics can bind to microtubules potentially altering their structure or preventing them from performing their usual tasks. 
So it's like the anesthetic is throwing a wrench into the delicate machinery of the microtubules, and that's somehow disrupting consciousness. That's a good analogy. But it's important to note that this is still an area of active research. We need more studies to pinpoint the precise mechanisms involved and to confirm whether these interactions are truly disrupting quantum processes. Yeah, I can imagine that's a tough thing to study. I mean, how you even observe quantum effects happening in something as complex as a living brain, let alone how they're being affected by anesthetics. Incredibly challenging. But researchers are developing new technologies and experimental techniques all the time. One promising avenue involves using tools from quantum information science mm -hmm. to probe those delicate quantum states within biological systems. It's still early days, but it's a rapidly evolving field. Sounds like we're on the verge of some really groundbreaking discoveries, but let's back up a bit yeah. and talk about the implications of all this for our understanding of consciousness. If quantum mechanics is really playing a role, does that change how we think about what consciousness is and how it works? Absolutely. It, uh, yeah. it challenges the traditional view of the brain as a purely classical system. If quantum processes are involved, it suggests that our brains might be utilizing some of the strange and counterintuitive properties of quantum mechanics, things like superposition and entanglement, to create the experience of consciousness. Wow, that's a pretty radical shift in perspective. So how does the Orshawar hypothesis fit into all of this? Does it provide a specific model for how these quantum processes might be giving rise to consciousness? It attempts to, but yeah. it's important to remember that it's just one hypothesis among many. It's a starting point for exploring these ideas. And it has sparked a lot of valuable discussion and debate. Right, and you mentioned earlier that there's been some skepticism about Orcher. What are some of the main criticisms? One of the most common criticisms is that the brain is simply too warm, wet, and noisy for delicate quantum states to survive long enough to be relevant for consciousness. The idea is that those quantum effects would decohere too quickly in the chaotic environment of the brain. So it's like trying to build a quantum computer out of jello. Well, it's not quite that extreme, but you get the idea. Maintaining those delicate quantum states is a huge challenge, even in highly controlled laboratory settings. So the question is, could the brain somehow be doing it within the messy environment of living cells? Right, it's a good question, and I guess the jury's still out on that one. But even if Orcher turns out to be wrong, the fact that it's prompted this kind of exploration seems valuable. I completely agree. Sometimes, uh, sometimes asking bold questions and exploring unconventional ideas is what pushes science forward. So what are some of the alternative theories out there? Are there other ways that quantum mechanics could be involved in consciousness? There are definitely other avenues being explored. For example, some researchers are focusing on how quantum entanglement might play a role in communication between neurons. So instead of individual microtubules being the seat of consciousness, it could be that the connections between neurons facilitated by entanglement are somehow generating conscious experience. Exactly, it's a different perspective. Yeah. And it highlights how diverse the research in this field is becoming. Yeah, it's fascinating to think that we might be on the cusp of understanding how something as seemingly ethereal as consciousness could be linked to the fundamental laws of physics. It's a truly mind-boggling prospect, and it raises some pretty profound philosophical questions as well. Speaking of profound questions the article you shared also touches on the implications of all this for free will, which is a whole other can of worms. Oh, it certainly is. The question of whether we have true free will, or whether our actions are predetermined, has been debated for centuries. And if quantum mechanics is involved in consciousness, it adds a whole new layer of complexity to the debate. That's where I'm hoping we can head next in this deep dive. Because if our brains are operating on a quantum level, does that mean our choices are truly random? Or is there something else at play? All right, so we've gone pretty deep into this whole quantum mechanics and consciousness thing, explored microtubules anesthetics, so now we're getting into even more mind-bending territory. Free will. If our brains are really harnessing these quantum phenomena, does that mean our choices are already made? Or do we actually have free will? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a question that's plagued philosophers and scientists for ages. And now quantum mechanics is adding fuel to the fire. Yeah. To even begin to unpack this, we need to remember that quantum mechanics introduces an element of probability mm. that we don't see in classical physics. Right, like that quantum dice analogy we talked about. We can't predict with certainty which way it's going to land. Exactly. That inherent randomness in quantum mechanics suggests that if our brains are utilizing these processes, then there might be a fundamental randomness to our thoughts and decisions as well. So instead of our brains being predictable machines, they might be more like a cosmic game of chance 
That's a pretty wild thought. So does that mean we're not really in control of our choices? Well, it depends on how you interpret things. Some physicists subscribe to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which suggests that for every quantum event, the universe splits into multiple parallel universes, each with a different outcome. Hold on. So you're saying that every time we make a decision, every time a neuron fires, there's a split in reality and another version of us exists somewhere out there making a different choice. That's the essence of the many worlds interpretation. It's a mind boggling concept. Yeah. And it definitely challenges our intuitive understanding of reality. It certainly does. But if that's true, wouldn't that mean our choices are already made in a sense that we're just playing out a pre-scripted role in this particular universe while countless other versions of ourselves are making different choices in other universes? It's a valid question. <laughs> But even if the many worlds interpretation is accurate, it doesn't necessarily rule out the subjective experience of free will. Okay, I'm not sure I understand. How can we have free will if every possible choice is being made in some other reality? Well, think about it this way. Even if there are infinite versions of ourselves out there making every possible choice, we are still only experiencing this specific reality, this specific chain of events. So even if our choices are playing out across countless universes, we only ever experience the consequences of the choices made by this particular version of ourselves in this particular reality. Precisely. Our lived experience, our sense of agency in making those choices still holds true, even if it's just one thread in a vast tapestry of possibilities. That's a pretty profound way to think about it. It seems like quantum mechanics, instead of taking away free will, might actually be expanding it in ways we never imagined. It's a fascinating possibility. It suggests that the universe might be far more complex and strange than we ever realized. And it also highlights how much we still have to learn about the nature of reality itself. Absolutely. It seems like this whole intersection of quantum mechanics and consciousness is pushing the boundaries of science and philosophy in really exciting ways. It's definitely a field that's ripe for exploration. Yeah. And who knows what incredible discoveries might be waiting for us as we continue to probe these deep questions. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today, from the potential role of microtubules to the mind-bending implications for free will. What's the key takeaway you hope our listeners walk away with? I think the most important takeaway is that the connection between quantum mechanics and consciousness is a field brimming with potential and mystery. It challenges us to expand our thinking about what's possible and to embrace the unknown. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's a reminder that science isn't just about finding definitive answers, but also about asking bold questions, exploring new frontiers, and staying open to the possibility that the universe might be even more amazing than we can currently imagine. And remember, even if some of the ideas we've discussed seem out there, the core principle of science remains the same, to follow the evidence wherever it leads. Well said. And on that note, we'll wrap up this deep dive. A huge thank you to our expert for illuminating this fascinating subject. As always, listeners, we encourage you to continue exploring questioning and diving deep into the mysteries of the universe. Until next time.